Good morning and welcome to this service of morning prayer on this snowy Sunday, January the 30th, the fourth Sunday after the Epiphany. The liturgy for this morning is the liturgy of the Word that is found on our bulletin for this Sunday, which is accessible through our website or through the link that was inserted in the newsletter that was emailed out yesterday. Let us begin. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom now and forever. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you govern all things both in heaven and on earth. Mercifully hear the supplications of your people and in our time grant us your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from the book of the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 1, beginning at verse 4. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over the nations and over kingdoms, to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 71, verses 1 through 6. In you, O Lord, have I taken refuge. Let me never be ashamed. In your righteousness, deliver me and set me free. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be my strong rock, a castle to keep me safe. You are my crag and my stronghold. Deliver me, my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the clutches of the evildoer and the oppressor. For you are my hope, O Lord God, my confidence since I was young. I have been sustained by you ever since I was born. From my mother's womb, you have been my strength. My praise shall always be of you. Our second reading this morning is from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. If I speak in tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. 
When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as, as I have been fully known, and now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Jesus began to speak in the synagogue at Nazareth. Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to the widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them were cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of a hill on which the town was built, so as they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The Gospel passage that you heard me read this morning is the second half of Luke's account of Jesus' first ministry to the worshippers at the local synagogue in Nazareth, his hometown. Last week, if you remember, we heard the account of Jesus reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah in what some considered was his inauguration speech. The prophecy from Isaiah was not only heard in the temple, but Jesus claimed that it had been fulfilled that day in his very being. Jesus' ministry was firmly anchored in the past. He links to his ministry back to the time of God's foretelling of the future through the words and actions of the great prophets. He would go on to live out his promise of fulfillment of the prophecy by taking the good news to the poor, releasing the captives, recovering sight for the blind, and letting the oppressed go free. His ministry was indeed a time of the Lord's favour. The reaction to Jesus' reading of the text that we hear today and claim to fulfilment was one of wow. You can imagine the headline in the first century tabloid, the Nazareth Post, Local Boy Makes Good. It's clear from Luke's account of Jesus impressed them because they all spoke well of him and were amazed at his gracious words that came from his mouth. Jesus could see through the thin veil of their compliments. Rather than bathe in the glory of a well-accepted speech, Jesus started to dismantle their pretentious stance. He fully understood that their real motivation in complimenting him was to encourage him to demonstrate for them the miracles that he'd performed in Capernaum. His notoriety had preceded him across the region. In Jesus' retort to the temple attendees that day, he drew on the actions of two great prophets to explain the real meaning of his ministry and to ground it. He wasn't going to be tempted into performing for the crowd as a way to win them over. In fact, Jesus goes the other way, metaphorically poking them. 
He gave them two examples of God acting for the outsider, the Gentiles over the chosen Israelites. Elijah found himself in the midst of a drought and a famine that he himself predicted as punishment for King Ahab's marriage to Jezebel and his turning from God to Baal to please her. With no food or water, God first sent Elijah to the desert to live in a ravine where he was fed by ravens and drank from a brook. When that time ended, God sent him from the desert east of the Jordan to the coastal town of Zarephath, about 60 miles northwest, and to a widow's house. Elijah found that he was in the hands of a Gentile woman and far from home. Why this woman? When Elijah probably passed hundreds of widows with whom he could have rested and been fed. She was an outsider. Similarly, Elisha, who succeeded Elijah as prophet, healed Naaman, a commander of the army of the king of Aram. Naaman, a Syrian, expected Elisha to greet him personally when he came calling and to make a big deal about healing his leprosy. When Elisha sent a messenger to tell Naaman the, what he had to do to be cleansed, he refused because he felt ignored. Eventually, he relented and bathed in the River Jordan, as Elisha had instructed, and was miraculously cured. Now, these two accounts have one common thread. Two great prophets bring healing and support to a couple of rank outsiders. Both the widow and the army commander become firm believers in the God of Israel because of the prophet's actions. God had thrown a wide net to reach these outsiders because of the rejection of God by the favorite Israelites. When the members of the synagogue heard Jesus tell these historical accounts, they turned him over and wanted to throw him off a cliff. They were incensed that the miraculous work of God that they had been expecting through their hometown boy Jesus was not to be. They weren't to be the vessels for the unfolding of God's new narrative. Believing they were the insiders, they now found themselves on the outside of God's new plan. This was for them, and is for us, an uncomfortable place to be. God's plan for salvation includes everyone, not just those inside of the church, or even those that call themselves Christian. God's plan is greater and grander than anything we can imagine. New God-directed narratives are unfolding all around us, but we might not be attuned to them, nor to God's desire. God is unfolding these narratives through the particulars of outsiders, of what biblical commentator David Osterdorf calls edge people, who come to God and bear witness to God through God's actions in edge places, and occasionally in church settings. For Elijah and Elisha, the edge places were deserts, ravines, struggling widows and dying sons, disbelieving people of power and prophets living lives of faith in these places. Our edge places might be the parks in our neighbourhood, the armory on Bedford Avenue, Atlantic Terminal, Pacific Park and the local coffee shop, wherever we might find widows, released prisoners, dying and sick children, disbelieving people of power and certainly the lost. We cannot confine God to our temples, to these beautiful houses of prayer and worship, no matter how much we desire it. We are called to find the edge places, to go there and to connect with those who live there. For us, we can be caught up in our common life, worrying that we don't have enough money to pay the bills or people to provide enough stewardship income to sustain the ministry we desire. We can fret and be anxious, but it won't change God's unfolding narrative. When we become consumed by these worries, it is because we are focusing on the subject of concern and not the process of connecting with those on the outside. It costs hardly anything to connect with other people. We connect with people all over the place, and maybe it costs us just a cup of coffee. So why would we allow money to be a barrier to helping people fall in love with Jesus? 
I love this wonderful phrase that was, co that was coined by Father George Vanderwater, the former rector of St. Luke's, who preached at the rededication of this church following the 1914 fire. God's unfolding narrative for our faith community is, I believe, bound up in the changing of this neighbourhood. We are upgrading our buildings and preparing our hearts in readiness. Nothing then should stand in our way of God's unfolding narrative, except the limits of our own love for connecting people with Jesus. Our challenge is to find these people and to connect them in this neighbourhood. Say one person each and give witness to our love for Jesus and our love for the faith community. If even half of them become curious and intrigued by our love and witness, we would have made a big difference in their lives and the lives of this worshipping community. They may want to join us to explore their spirituality, to join in worship and to give thanks with us and pray. They may seek baptism or pastoral counselling about a troubling issue, or they may seek marriage here. We are here as the body of Christ and as a spiritual beacon in this very community. The work of the Holy Spirit, the unfolding of God's narrative and plan for this area, is only limited by our actions and or our lack of courage. Amazing connections and ministry could be just about, about to be revealed to us. We stand on the cusp in this dense urban village of a renaissance as God works out God's plan through us. God is leading us to the other, to the edge places, to those that crave love, justice and mercy, and those that want to work for peace and a better world in a Christian context. Connection and the practice of radical welcome have to be the processes we focus on to ensure that those we reach feel welcomed and connected to Jesus first and to this holy place second, not just on Sundays, but every day. The challenge that awaits the new vestry is immense, both for me and hopefully you, extremely exciting. We are not alone in this work as we are all instruments of God's grace and work the hands that God gave us. We are a community of faith that loves and serves the Lord Jesus Christ and through our infectious love will help others to fall in love with Jesus too. Amen. We'll now pray the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. My fellow pilgrims, the Lord is our strong rock, a castle to keep us safe. In confidence, let us pray. In you, O Lord, have we taken refuge. Let us never be ashamed. 
Increase our love, O God. Deliver your church from boastfulness and arrogance. Fill us instead with patience and kindness. In you, O Lord, have we taken refuge. Let us never be ashamed. Increase our love, O God. Deliver this nation from pride and fear. Give us eyes to see your hand at work in all nations and peoples. God bless the world. In you, O Lord, have we taken refuge. Let us never be ashamed. Increase our love, O God. Let it not be limited only to other human beings, but spread to all that you have made. In you, O Lord, have we taken refuge. Let us never be ashamed. <clears throat> Increase our love, O God. May we seek and serve Christ in our neighbours, in family, friends and strangers. In you, O Lord, have we taken refuge. Let us never be ashamed. Increase our love, O God. By the power of your great love, heal those who are ill. Strengthen those who are struggling to endure great pain. We pray that as we lift our brothers and sisters to you in prayer, they will even now feel our love. In you, O Lord, have we taken refuge. Let us never be ashamed. Increase our trust in your love, O God. May those who have died find in your presence everlasting and overwhelming love. In you, O Lord, have we taken refuge. Let us never be ashamed. Almighty God, to whom our needs are known before we ask, Help us to ask only what accords with your will and those good things which we dare not or in our blindness cannot ask. Grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We'll now pray the prayer of general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honour and glory throughout all ages. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you forever. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.